an intervention. Thanks, Erin. I need, that's what I need. Um, all right. So it's noon and I know people are still, yeah. um, but please go ahead and continue to introduce yourselves in the chat. And um, we want to know who you are and, and um, you know, a little bit about you so that we can have a better sense of who's here with us today. Um, uh, I'm interested in, in, you know, where people are from, what institution, what your role is, and what your interest in being a reviewer is. Um, and that's what we're here today to, uh, to talk about is uh, becoming a, an online um, uh, course reviewer with Oscar. Um, I'm Alexandra Pickett and I'm here with Erin Maney. Um, um, we are at SUNY Online. I'm the director of online teaching and have been here for a long time. I may know some of you um, for, you know, 20 plus years. Um, and maybe some of you I haven't um, had the opportunity to meet yet. But um, I uh, have been in charge uh, of online teaching and instructional design and faculty development at SUNY for, um, they tell me it's the 30th year that I've been here, so very long time. Um, I also think of myself as Oscar's mom, and I'm very proud of uh, my little Oscar, who is now um, our little Oscar, who is now um, all over the world in uh, the hands of thousands of individuals and institutions who are using it and adapting it to um, do course reviews and in different um, um, mo you know, models of course reviews. Um, so if you were here last time, we were talking about using it as a self-assessment. So if you're an online instructor, um, you can use it as a, as a, as a self-assessment, but you can, Oscar was designed intentionally to be flexible uh, and to be able to be used in multiple types of um, course review, uh, um, um, like modalities, right? So different different ways to do it. Um, I was the first ID in, um, in SUNY in 1994, where there was no such thing as a learning management system. And it was really like a proof of concept um, and we had grant funding to explore asynchronous online learning. And so, yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, I've trained somewhere around 5,000 or so, probably more than that faculty, um, either directly or indirectly, maybe three, 400 um, SUNY online IDs and actually IDs outside of SUNY as well. Um, I've been an online instructor for many years at the as an adjunct um, in the Department of Education Theory and Practice at U Albany, and um, I'm actually a PhD candidate and I'm finishing <laughs> my dissertation right now. Um, every spare cell in my brain is focused on that primarily. Um, and my interest is in um, epistemic beliefs in faculty, especially STEM faculty and how that impacts their transition to online environments. And if you are interested anytime, I will talk to you about that. I'm very passionate about it. Um, I'm also a Middle States peer reviewer uh, and have contributed a number of times to the Educause Horizon uh, report um, on uh, various of those reports, the higher education uh, one, the teaching and learning one, the student support one. Um, and um, the course I taught at UAlbany, I don't know if I mentioned, was Intro to Online Teaching. It's a fully online course in the CDIT master's program required for the cult certificate. I haven't been teaching recently because I'm working on this pesky dissertation. Um, but um, but yeah, I love teaching online. And I, you know, I always introduce myself as Arrow's mom, Arrow's my kiddo. And I always say I'm an artist because I am in my blood. And I always say I know a little bit about online teaching because I'm always learning more and I'm happy to be here with you and that you are spending your lunch time with us um, 
to learn more about being an Oscar reviewer and um, how to use Oscar and some of the tools and resources and approaches um, that we want to share with you regarding doing um, uh, uh, course reviews um, with Oscar. So I'm super happy um, to be here. Um, Aaron is my partner in crime here and, and, um, and we have a full, you know, um, exciting ride for you if you can see all of my tabs there we're going to go through every one of those tabs and um the first thing i want you to know is that you don't have to worry about capturing screenshots or about the urls or anything everything that i'm going to show you is on this um google doc and aaron's going to post that link for me in the chat the google doc has everything on it that you could possibly be interested in regarding this session, including the slides, including um, all of the links, as I mentioned, that we're going to go through. And um, we are going to go through all of this. And I'm really happy to engage um, with you to show you these resources and walk you through the process of becoming familiar with Oscar and the tools and how to apply some of the standards. Um, so let's go back to the slides. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, just do a brief review of the agenda. So we're going to give you an uh, introduction to um, Oscar and um, we're going to um, focus on um, the information that's being presented for those who want to be reviewers. Last time we did this, it was for faculty who are, were interested in doing a self-assessment to improve their um, their uh, the design of their online courses. This workshop is intended for reviewers. Um, it's very similar to the intro that we did for the faculty, but it frames things from the perspective of somebody wanting to do a review on somebody else's course, not you doing it on your own course. So we're going to look at the tools and the resources. Um, you, we're going to show you how to get access to Oscar. And then um, we're going to have some bonus stuff at the end um, in terms of community and um, and continuing to network around Oscar and its use as a um, um, you know a tool and process for um, for conducting course reviews. So I expect there may be a bunch of faculty um, in the room who are interested in being peer reviewers for either within their department or across their institution. There are likely um, instructional designers in the, in the room as well who have been using Oscar for years and are here because they want the badge. And I want to give you the badge so much. So thank you for coming. Um, and lots of people within SUNY who have lots of expertise using Oscar and doing course reviews pretty much from the first day. Um, and then there may be those of you who are either new to SUNY or not from SUNY or new instructional designers and you are trying to understand the tools and the process and how to apply the rubric and, and the standards. And so you know, for all of you, um, this session will give you all of that and, and more, I think. Um, so let's see, what else do we want to do? Uh, just a little bit about the timeline in case you're interested. Uh, you know, we've been doing, um, you know, Oscar was initially conceptualized, well, probably back in 1994, I had it designed in my head, but we didn't actually uh, develop it until uh, 2013, and then um, th a number of activities and versions and awards and events happened uh, have happened since 2013. So just to give you a sense of of our timeline there with Oscar um, and the various events that um, have occurred over time, um, and you know to know a, a, a wonderful team of folks um, initiate were the initial group that contributed. Maybe some of you are in the room. Um, and I just, you know, there's a page on the Oscar website, I'll show you in a second, that shows all of the different people who have been um, contributors in one way or another to the development of this tool. It's been a very um, collaborative uh, process to develop um, Oscar to continuously improve it and maintain it. And we've gone through four, we're up to version four, um, 
uh, at this point. We've got 4.1. I'll tell you a little bit about that um, just recently um, with the, the addition of the COIL plus OSCAR standards. I'll, I'll um, touch on that in a sec. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with, with, um, with OSCAR or just need a review, I'm going to show you the video and it is short, uh, but it really encapsulates or summarizes really well what OSCAR is and what it does. And so I am going to do that now, fire that video up right now. <laughs> SUNY Online has developed an online course design rubric and process that addresses both the instructional design and accessibility of an online course that is openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt. The aim of the SUNY Online Course Quality Review, or OSCAR, rubric and process is to support continuous improvements to the quality and accessibility of online courses, while also providing a systematic approach to collect data across campuses, institutions, departments, and programs. This data can be used to inform faculty development and support large-scale online course design, review, and refresh efforts consistently. There are two components, the OSCAR process and the OSCAR rubric. The OSCAR process provides a framework and a dashboard to support a campus-tailored and scalable approach to improving the instructional design and accessibility of online or blended courses. There are three parts to the process. The online course review, using the OSCAR rubric, yields an action plan that informs the online course refresh process by targeting areas for improvements. After the identified areas have been refreshed and implemented, the learning review closes the continuous improvement loop to confirm the success of the changes made and the development of a plan for the next set of improvements. The dashboard is housed in Google Drive, which allows for free storage and collaboration. It automates campus level review efforts and accommodates customized rubrics by managing all the rubrics for the institution. Built in analytics track course review progress and can be used to identify online course design trends. Working with multi-institutional teams of SUNY Online instructional designers, librarians, distance learning directors, technologists, and accessibility experts, SUNY Online staff started with 20 years of SUNY Learning Network research-informed best online practices, the Chico Rubric, Universal Learning Design Principles, the SUNY Office of General Counsel's Memorandum on Accessibility Considerations, and conducted a gap analysis with Quality Matters, iNicole, and Blackboard exemplary courses. The resulting 50 standards in the rubric target online instructional design and incorporate the community of inquiry model, the seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education, the adult learner, Bloom's taxonomy, how people learn, and has been mapped to the SUNY online fundamental and core competencies for online course design. OSCAR is the first online course quality rubric that specifically addresses the U.S. Department of Education regulation requirements for regular and substantive interaction, RSI, in the design of online courses. OSCAR can be leveraged by faculty, instructional designers, departments, and institutions to assist in planning, designing, improving, documenting, and implementing online courses and programs that are in compliance with RSI regulations. OSCAR standards guide online course design and refresh efforts, as well as faculty development activities to support RSI compliance in new online course development and review of existing online courses. OSCAR standards can be used by online faculty and instructional designers in faculty self-assessments, faculty training activities, resource materials, course reviews, as recommendations and standards to support and document how the online course meets the RSI requirements. The rubric is easy to use, flexible, non-evaluative, requires no storage space, can be customized, and can be implemented in a variety of ways. As part of an online faculty development and online course design professional development process, as an online faculty self-assessment, as part of an online course quality review process by online instructional designers, as a faculty peer review process, in a multidisciplinary collaborative team review model. 
The rubric also produces an action plan, allows for prioritization of standards, estimates amount of time to make improvements, offers suggestions and examples for improvements, accommodates modification and addition of standards. The 50 Oscar rubric standards also integrate specific ways to make an online course accessible to students with disabilities and specific suggestions for ensuring regular and substantive interaction in online course design. Oscar was adopted by the Online Learning Consortium in 2016 and is featured as the online course quality rubric in their suite of online quality scorecards. The SUNY Online Oscar rubric is flexible, customizable, research-based, openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt, and nationally recognized. It is currently being used by 56 SUNY institutions and thousands of non-SUNY institutions and individuals. For more information on SUNY Online and OSCAR, visit oscar.suny.edu. So, um, one of the things I love about that um, video is that it's a really good tool if you're uh, trying to explain what OSCAR is to someone who's not familiar with it, either a, you know, a department chair or um, a program, um, uh, you know, one of your program heads or some administrator um, at your institution that might be interested. Um, so it's a really good succinct way to sort of introduce um, what Oscar is and, and what it does. Um, the thing I want to make sure to highlight um, for you is that it is, um, as I described in the video, um, it's not just a rubric, it's also a, uh, a process and a set of tools. And, um, and I, I think that's important to note. Um, and the other thing is that it is intended um, as, a, as a way to initiate conversations around continuous improvement. So it's, it's, it can be used and, and people do use it at, uh, as part of their um, online course quality initiatives. Um, I prefer to frame it from a perspective of supporting a, a culture of continuous um, improvements in terms of the design of the course, which obviously results in course quality, but um, I, it's not intended to be a faculty evaluation tool or a course um, um, evaluation tool. Um, it really is intended to support the process of continuous improvement, which includes the review um, with the rubric and, and uh, includes the refresh that once you review the course, you then improve the course with what you learned from the review. And then you close the loop by then teaching the course with those improvements made and coming back and seeing what worked and what needs to continue to be improved. Um, again, to sort of reiterate some of the unique things about Oscar in, in terms of, um, you know, of the, the whole package of the rubric, the process and the materials, it's intended to be non-evaluative. Um, it's extensible, meaning it, it can accommodate the addition and edits and eliminations of standards. Uh, so for example, your nursing program that's online may have specific standards associated with it that are um, determined by their accrediting body, and you might want to incorporate those into um, the rubric when you're reviewing those courses in a, in a full uh, online nursing program. And that will definitely be different than your, um, you know, either an individual um, humanities course or your whatever um, program in whatever other discipline uh, you might have. They, they might have different, um, well, they're definitely not going to have this, the nursing standards incorporated. Um, so uh, another difference or unique thing about it is that it's not restricted to mature courses. Um, there's other rubrics that are out there. Any rubric is better than no rubric. Uh, some of them have positions um, in terms of how they're implemented that they be only applied to um, experienced online instructors with fully mature online um, uh, courses. Oscar was intentionally designed to not do that. We really feel strongly that um, 
the, the standards should be introduced to new online faculty so that as they're developing their first online course, they are uh, aware of uh, the best practices that um, are um, involved in, in developing a good, um, effective, uh, successful online course. So there, it's intended to be used formatively with new faculty and new courses, as well as you know some summative um, reviews like the self-assessment or like for those of you who are going to be course reviewers, um, for those of you uh, conducting those kinds of activities. Um, it uh, the action plan that was mentioned in the video is another unique thing to assist with prioritizing for the refresh, um, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, it also, as the video um, explained, uh, targets RSI to um, assist and inform compliance efforts, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, it's openly licensed, unlike you know, other um, commercially uh, focused tools. Um, and, you know, it's also free. Um, and uh, it's, it's, I talked a little bit about the flexibility. It's intentionally designed to accommodate a variety of course review and refresh um, models and with that focus on continuous improvement. So those are some of the unique things about Oscar that I think are important and relevant when you're thinking about um, when you're thinking about Oscar. It's a process. It's a, a tool, obviously a rubric, but it's also materials that support that continuous improvement. And it's um, you know flexible to accommodate whatever type of um, continuous improvement uh, you are implementing. Uh, okay, so let's do a tour, a little quick tour of the website, and you'll find it at oscar.suny.edu, which Aaron will pop in the chat. And um, under the about link, you'll find information, including that video, you'll find this graphic about the process, and you'll find all of the stuff that's unique about Oscar that I just went through, some of the unique aspects of, of Oscar. So I'm just pointing this out to you. So if you're looking for that kind of information, it's under the about page. Um, the standards themselves, there's 50 of them, and they are organized into broad categories. And then each, um, each category has the number of standards that are associated with it um, under, this, uh, under this link, as you can see. Um, and so when you click on any one of these broader categories, you get the list of them, and then you can actually click right here from here right to the um to the standard or you can go and um and go directly to um to a standard from um from the drop down menu there the um each standard is set up in in the in a consistent way um and they all initiate they all start with a, a an exam um, a description of what the standard is about um, you'll see a little mini micro learning video here these are videos that we captured from within our own community across the SUNY system you'll see all your colleagues um, many of your colleagues were um, participated in in these interviews to talk about each standard and why it's important and how they implement it and and depending on their perspective. Some are instructional designers, some are faculty, some are administrators, some are librarians. So you'll get a good breadth of understanding of what each standard is about and why it's important and how um, it can be implemented. Um, if the standard is related in some way to RSI, there'll be a section on that. And you can see the little RSI graphic up at the top. And then there's a section here um, specifically about it. And then there, in every standard has general suggestions on how to address this particular um, best practice and, and ideas. So if you're an instructor, you can come here to look for ideas. If you're an instructional designer or a peer reviewer and you're looking at a particular standard um, and a course and how the course is implementing or addressing that particular standard, you can, and they, and you've determine that they need, you know, that it could be improved in some way, you can come here um, to look for ideas on how to improve, um, um, you know, the design of that particular, the implementation of that particular standard in the design of the course. There'll be examples, there might be 
um, some instructions um, or guidelines uh, or things to help you to, um, uh, in this particular case, how to create a, a welcome video. And this uh, standard is about, in, the course includes a welcome and getting started, um, you know, area and content. So um, one of the recommendations is to create um, intro videos. Um, and then um, there'll always be some additional information. In this case, it's links to um, um, the topper repository from our friends at UCF, which is a wonderful um, juried um, repository of effective practices. And I'll actually show it to you in, in a minute. Um, but each standard, if, if there are associated um, topper practices, we've included them here. And then we um, will typically have some additional resources to explore and the opportunity for people to either uh, comment or to contribute um, additional ideas and resources to the web page on that particular standard. Um, so all of the standards are set up in this consistent manner. Um, let's see. So um, I want to share with you uh, here how to get Oscar. Um, and um, actually, before I do that, uh, I'm going to show you the RSI website just to show you that here's the information. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on that in a bit, but you'll see there's a drop down and, and there's a list of the standards, how Oscar supports RSI, what's new, and some references and resources if you're interested in diving um, more deeply into RSI. I had mentioned earlier the COIL standards, and COIL is our SUNY Center for Online International Learning. Um, Hope Wendell is the director of that program. Um, it's out of uh, SUNY Oneonta. And um, we collaborated to create a set of, of um, COIL standards that, um, can, that can be used by people doing virtual exchange or, um, or experiential learning that's cross-cultural. And so there's a number of, of standards that um, are COIL specific that we've incorporated into um, the OSCAR rubric as an additional. So if your instructor or your campus or your course or program are doing virtual exchange, these are um, some standards that can be used to assist in improving, you know, continuously improving the design of those um, of those activities. The, one of the cool things about it is that we now have Oscar in Spanish as a result of this project. The, so the whole rubric is available in Spanish for any our, of our Spanish speaking colleagues. And um, we have documentation associated with the COIL standards also um, uh, translated into Spanish, and we have plans and intentions to actually provide the ability to uh, translate the entire Oscar website into into Spanish. We're working on that currently. Um, all right. So, um, oh no, I didn't finish. I didn't finish here. So um, we have some awards. I did want to show you the acknowledgements. So this is the list of all of the people who have contributed to Oscar over the years. Um, and you can come down and find yourself if you were one of the contributors um, for the different versions of Oscar or, or um, you know, there's some in information and it's like a historical record of everyone who's contributed in some way or another. Um, I wanted to mention we have a link for research, which I actually think is not working at the moment. We've had some trouble with our websites. Um, we have a community page. So we have people within the community, both internal to SUNY and external, who have developed tools, materials, and resources around Oscar. And so if I'm aware of them, if you send them to me, I'll put them up on this page. Um, so you can, um, you know, so we can more broadly share the, the work that the Oscar community is, um, is doing. So, um, so you can check this out. Uh, and then there's information about our webinars and certification and information about course design. All right, now I'm gonna go back to how to get Oscar. And this is the one that has, um, that's in Spanish and that has the, um, uh, so, so this is the one that's in Spanish, it's, it's, a, it's a PDF. And um, then the one that's in English is the one right above it. The one that has COIL standards in it in English is down here uh, below. 
And then um, we have that one also in Spanish. And so it's as easy as coming to this website and clicking on the links um, to either get the PDF versions of the um, um, of the rubric or the interactive versions. And I'm gonna show those to you. You can also get the, the PDF version from the Online Learning Consortium. They have it here on their page. You just click this download and it just will ask you for your name and your email address. It might ask you for your state uh, and it downloads immediately. Um, so you can get it from there too. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, and it's this is a fillable PDF. Um, and you can see that, you know, you can click on it and, uh, make different, uh, choices. You can write your narrative, um, you know, notes about each of the standards here. Um, you can click on each of these standards and get to the appropriate web page, um, on the Oscar website. There's the indication of whether or not it's associated with RSI at, at all. And you can see it's all 50 standards. And then there's a big block at the end for your narrative feedback. As course reviewers, um, you're gonna go through this rubric, fill it out, you know, look at each standard, look at the course, fill it out, um, and note whether the standard is sufficiently present, that it requires a minor revision, which is a half hour or less, that it requires a moderate revision, which would be a half hour to two hours, or whether it's a major revision in your estimation, something that would take you more than two hours to address. Or maybe it's not applicable because it's not something that um, is relevant for the course. So you would fill it out. Um, and if you need additional ideas or suggestions for your action plan, you just click on the um, on the standard itself and it takes you to the web page for that particular standard so you can look for ideas. Now, um, I mentioned, and this is something we didn't show in the um, in the uh, uh, the first training on for self assessment, um, the interactive version of the rubric. And well, I guess we we did show it in the first one. We didn't do the dashboard, so I'll just show you how to get the interactive version of the rubric on that Get Oscar page. You go to um, generate your interactive rubric. And it'll take you to this form. You just give your name and your name of your course, uh, your email address and the name of your course. And then it will generate the rubric for you. It's going to take a minute for that to happen. Um, and it comes to you in an email. And it will come with instructions uh, on what to do and how to do it, what link to click. And you make a copy of it because it's a... Um, it's a template, right? This is a template. Um, and so each course, um, each rub each of the interactive rubrics starts with the sort of overview of what the course is about and uh, to help you as the course reviewer document um, some you know, general details about the course. Uh, and then you have a series of tabs down here. And as the instructional designer or as the instructor of record or as the reviewer, you get your own tab and you fill it out by clicking um, in the, um, in the, in the, in each of these. Uh, this is essentially a spreadsheet. Um, it's taking a while for it to render there. I'm not sure why it's not working, but um, all right. So you just, you fill it out and then you document your, um, you document your, I have too many things going on and the web page is not functioning, but you sh can click on each of these little blocks, add an X and it'll eliminate the other X. And, and here's where you would write your, um, your action ideas to improve the course. And if you need additional ideas, you can click directly over to the, um, to the website. So it functions a little bit differently than the PDF. And over here, you see these little uh, triangles or, or 
or little carrots or whatever they are, if you mouse over them, they give you additional information right there in line with each of the standards so that you can get some additional um, um, information uh, explaining the standard and some of the ways to, um, to address the standard. And again, you're thinking about things from the perspective of how long it takes to fix. Um, this was an intentional design decision on how, you know, we're not evaluating quality in, with this, um, even though, you know, some people do and, and it's possible to do that. And obviously these things that need improvement will improve the quality, but we focused really on the process of continuous improvement to support that. And so estimating the amount of time to fix then will help you to make decisions and determinations about what to fix in the course before um, the next time you teach it. And so as you, this is a spreadsheet. Uh, uh, so, and the interactiveness uh, means that as you fill this out, um, it begins to build your action plan. So the action plan is this last tab over here and everything that the instructional designer fills out or that the faculty fills out or that the reviewer fills out will aggregate on this action plan. So if you have a model where you have a, you know, multiple people reviewing a course, all of those, all of that feedback will um, aggregate on this action plan. If it's only the faculty person doing a self-assessment, you just use the faculty tab and then, and then you go from there. You just ignore the other tabs. If you are doing peer review, um, you can, um, uh, you know, have multiple people do uh, be peer reviewers and they can be within the same discipline or multidisciplinary. You could have librarians, you could have a student, um, you, you know, this will accommodate anyone um, and any model that you are interested in implementing or able to implement. It's going to depend on your, your context and what's possible um, and what you're trying to achieve. Uh, so this action plan aggregates it all and it tells you the time to fix how long it's going to take and it's got a point of view about whether or not that particular fix is essential or important and because this is an openly licensed tool if you don't agree with the way that we um you know for whatever reason it might be that something is more essential for a different course in a different discipline or whatever you can have multiple types of rubrics for different purposes um it it's a it will accommodate you um uh, customizing um, that, you know, whether it's important or essential, you can even change that language if that's not how you want to address it. Um, and then you can use this as your action plan to make the improvements on the course. So you can decide, okay, I'm just going to fix the essential stuff. Or I'm going to fix these three things that were um, that were tagged essential, um, knowing that in the future you need to come back to your action plan and um, reassess and and whatever it is you fix, determine did it work? Um, does it still need more improvement? And then come back to your list of things that need fixing and continue down your list. So it's not assumed like you can't fail, Oscar. I, I didn't say that at the beginning. It, well, that's one of the other things that's unique about Oscar. You can't fail Oscar. The whole point is that you are thinking about it as an iterative process that you are continuously improving and it's not ever done. You are always going to want to improve the design of your course and your skills in teaching. The technology will always change. Your content in your discipline may change um, from time to time. And so it is a continuous improvement process. So um, so this, this um, action plan helps you to understand what needs to be done and to keep track of it and to help with prioritization of what you might want to do. Um, all right. So um, <laughs> the dashboard was what I didn't show uh, in the previous training. And the dashboard is for larger scale um, online um, uh, continuous improvement initiatives. And what the dashboard allows you to do is to as the manager of a 
review process and whether that's at the entire institutional level at the programmatic level degree you know if you, if you have a fully online degree program um or a degree program that you're even if it's hybrid if you want to evaluate it um or at the departmental level disciplinary level this allows you as a manager of of a continuous improvement process that is of larger scale to organize and track reviews. So as you can see here, we have a number of courses. This is just a demo, right? And um, from this um, um, from this website, from the spreadsheet, you can add a course rubric, you can um, uh, do uh, add additional unique rubrics. You can um, archive them. There's some analytics that you can run. Um, you can um, create a new, this is where you create the new one. And then this is where you add the ones that you've created and so forth. So in this particular demo, I have a number of courses. Each one of these course codes links to the specific rubric that I generated using this dashboard. So as the manager of this, I can create these rubrics associated with these particular courses. Um, it provides the direct link, as you can see, I'm mousing over these links, and it's taking me to these separate rubrics that are associated with these courses. This first one is um, Introduction to Watercolors. And um, you can see that the ID um, has completed their review, the instructor has completed their review, and the reviewer has completed their review. There's no time, it's, it's done. And the ID was Bill, and uh, my note here is to this course is ready to go and, and can go live tomorrow. Unfortunately, in my intro to online teaching class, the ID has not done the review. The faculty hasn't uh, started it yet and neither has the first reviewer. And so Aaron is the ID on this and uh, needs to get started on the process. Sorry, Aaron. Um, in the French two course, uh, it's 84% done by the ID it, and it's 40% done by the instructor and the first reviewer has started. Um, and that reviewer is, that ID is Rob and, um, I want them to make special, pay special attention to the assessment components of the course and so forth. And, um, and so um, the, this is the tool that you can use to, again, generate large numbers of, uh, generate and manage large, larger scale act, um, initiatives around um, the continuous improvement process that you might be um, implementing at, at your campus, at your department, or at your program levels. All right, let's move on to some of the tools and the resources that we have. I'm going to show the templates in a minute, um, but we have a set of templates designed in Brightspace in multiple modalities. Um, and they are all Oscar informed and very well designed and documented in terms of how they um, how they um, um, are aligned with Oscar standards and are a very good tool um, for instructional designers to use um, to help quick start faculty into effective online course um, designs and and shells. Um, so I'll show those to you in a second. They come with guides. Um, there's an Oscar alignment document that I'll show you. There's the rationale for the decisions that were made, a frequently asked questions. We have some tours of courses that were designed um, with, um, with the rubrics um, and some playlists for you to take a look at if you're interested in seeing courses that implement the um, uh, those rubrics, uh, sorry, those uh, those templates. One other thing is they're, they are designed in Brightspace, but they've been exported not just as Brightspace zip files, but also in the common cartridge format. So you can literally take these common cartridges and import them into any learning management system and, and, um, and use them. And they're openly licensed and they're free for anyone to use and adapt. Um, some other things, um, the online course quality syllabus, I, I'll show you in a minute as well, which is also Oscar infused. Let's go to our next, um, ah, I'm not sure. 
where we are here. So it, we're going to standard three. We're going to start looking at the standards and how to apply them, thinking, uh, you know, uh, of those of you in the room who want to be course reviewers, um, you would, you know, essentially start at the beginning, open up a course and look at standard one. And, and the first one, as I showed you earlier, was about um, having a, a, a good welcome and introduction to the course. So as you work through the standards, you take a look at what the standard is about, familiarize yourself with what, um, you know, the description of it and, and what the effective practice entails by reading the description and taking a look at the little mini learning video. Um, this particular one, number three, um, is a, about making sure that the course has a course information area and syllabus that makes the course expectations clear and findable. So if you are an instructional designer or an online instructor, you know how important this is in terms of an, an online course, um, that those expectations need to be very, very clear and findable. Um, so um, that's one of the really important um, bits when you're looking at the course, how easy was it for you to find the course information, things like how to contact the instructor, how they're going to be evaluated, what are the books for the course, what's the course schedule, what are um, the expectations that the instructor has, um, all of those things. How easy is it when you enter a course to find those things? And so that's what this, this standard really is about and making those expectations not just clear, but also findable. So here's the syllabus that I mentioned to you um, that was Oscar informed, Oscar infused. Um, we developed this as part of the um, DLE project, the templates project to use in conjunction with them. And you can use this as a model. So you can check your own syllabus against the elements that exist in, in this um, um, syllabus, or you can make a copy of it. And, and actually it's a template so you, if you make a copy of it, then you can take it um, and modify it for your own um, for your own purposes. Uh, you can see after each element of the of the of the syllabus, there's a link to the Oscar standard that pertains to it. So every element that's in the syllabus has a related Oscar um, standard. There's some unique things um, that I think what I want to call your attention to in terms of um, of um, elements of a syllabus. So for example, this one includes, um, you know, how they want to be addressed and what their, um, their names and pronouns are. So they're modeling the behavior for the students of so sharing that information. And then they also have a statement within the syllabus to um, solicit that um, from the, the learners as well. It also includes a basic needs statement. Um, which I think um, is, you know, novel in, in some ways, um, maybe not so much after COVID, but, um, but certainly, you know, you want to consider if that's something you want to include in your, in your syllabus. Um, so when you're looking at a syllabus, you want to be looking to make sure that these things are clear and findable and that there is something that represents these different elements in, in the syllabus. Here, for example, is a statement full on about regular and substantive interaction. And one of the easiest ways to comply, or one of the elements to comply with this um, um, regulation is to have a statement about it in your syllabus. I do a whole workshop about RSI, but this is one of the easiest things you can do. And you want to help faculty be aware of this, and you want them to be consistent in terms of having um, not it not just in their syllabus, but um, in the design of their course as well. The other unique thing I think that I want to point out here about the syllabus, and again, you can see each one of these elements al is aligned with an Oscar standard. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out was the use of artificial intelligence. So look in the syllabus to see if the instructor has 
um, a, a statement about that, and then you can encourage them as the reviewer to implement it. Of course, you check with your instructional designer staff, you check with um, the policies and the procedures and, and things, um, you know, that might be um, institutional um, about this. Uh, but I just want to bring it to your attention so that you think about it and take a look and see if it's something that needs to be a, a addressed in the, in the, um, um, design of the course information for the course and incorporated into the syllabus. Uh, the campus policies, many institutions may have lots of different ways of sharing campus policies with their online learners. Some um, campuses have very, um, you know, um, uh, direct ways of specifically addressing online learners, especially if they have fully online programs um, at some campuses where that's not the case. It needs to be in the syllabus if you're doing a fully online course so that students can easily find the things that they are. We did um, we did some focus groups with online students and one of the their um, um, main things that they wanted to see in a syllabus was uh, procedures for resolving academic grievances and appeals, withdrawal um, um, and drop date policy. Those two things were um, were things that they highlighted as that it's really important um, from their perspectives to see those things in the syllabus. But all of these um, policies and all of these resources and access to services and those things um, you know, are, are really important for uh, online learners to have easy access to. So if it's not already taken care of, um, you know, in the in the nav bar of your course or your your um, um, learning management system, or there's not a web page that's specific to online learners, then you need to think about incorporating it into your syllabus. All right, let's move on to uh, oh the findability paper. So. Um, just briefly, um, this is some research that supports this issue of findability in an online course. And one of the things that I, um, you know, that literally blew my mind about this paper when I initially read it was not only that um, students reported lower levels of their belief in themselves to be able to be successful and their motivation for um, interacting in courses was affected by low findability. Um, and then there was also, um, um, I guess the thing that blew my mind was they not only had a negative perception of the quality of the course and it affected their motivation and their sense of ability to succeed, but it but also uh, they came away from the course believing that the instructor um, was, you know, not prepared and in fact not qualified to teach the course if they couldn't find something their their perception of the instructor was negative and that blew my that blew my mind because they're just looking for you know information but they're making judgments and assumptions about the ability of the instructor to teach the course as a result of not being able to find something so findability is super important so you're, as a reviewer, you need to be looking for that, right? How findable is the information that students need? Um, and that's all that course information stuff typically that is in a syllabus. But if the syllabus is buried in a PDF or if the information is buried in a syllabus PDF and that link is buried somewhere within the course and it's not so straightforward and easy to find, that's a problem and something you should highlight for improvement in your review. All right, let's look at our next um, our next standard that I wanted to talk with you about is the um, this one about having objectives being clearly defined and measurable and aligned to your activities and to your assessments. And this is the magic formula for a, a good online course design. You have very well designed objectives, um, learning objectives or outcomes. Those objectives are clearly, there. there is content that is associated with those objectives. There are activities that ask the students to interact with the content, with the concepts, with each other, and with you as the instructor um, um, that specifically 
they address that objective. And then there are specific assessments that are mapped to those activities. That is the magic formula. And so if you are doing stuff in the course, if anyone, you know, if you're looking at a course and those, those objectives don't have content associated with them or don't have specific activities associated with them or the assessments are not specifically aligned, then there's a there's a disconnect and a, and and it needs to be improved. Um, and if there's extra stuff to that, then it's too it's too much. You you know the magic formula is set number of outcomes with uh, or or objectives, content that is associated with it, activities that ask the students to actively engage, and um, and then an assessment that assesses that activity. Um, all right, so for this, I wanted to highlight a couple of resources. Um, and so one of the things that, that you might notice sometimes in a course, either yourself as the instructor or as an instructional designer, is that there is a tendency for um, for someone who's an expert in a particular topic to want to give all of their expertise to their students because they don't see them face to face. And so they want to make sure that everything that they know gets communicated. And so they put it all in their online course and it may be organized beautifully, but it's too much. And it becomes a course and a half, essentially, and it becomes bloated with um, with things that make it impossible in terms of the numbers of hours in a day for a learner to actually successfully accomplish it. So I wanted to provide a little bit of con you know context and a little bit of information to help instructional designers, course reviewers, and faculty kind of understand the. Um, um, you know, the appropriate amount of work for, for the, you know, that, that's actually doable. So there's a couple of tools. Um, and here I have outlined, you know, different types and lengths of courses, how many credits, whether it's undergraduate or graduate, to give you a rough sense of what is reasonable, of what is doable. And then coupled with this tool from Wake Forest University, um, this is a workload estimate, uh, estimator. And so you can come to this page and put in the information related to the course <clears throat> and it's going to give you a sense over here, down here at the bottom, uh, of uh, what the workload estimates are. And you can see that if you, if you um, manipulated, it's dynamic. So I'm moving the number of hours per assessment here, and you can see it's now gone up to 24 hours here. And then you can come back to this web page and see, oh, in a 15 week three credit course undergraduate course the expectation should be nine hours of work per week and over here i have 24.4 hours per week so something's got to give we need to figure out how and and the way you do it is with that magic formula what are your objectives what's the content what's the activity and what's the assessment that aligns with that and that's how you start to be able to know and understand what's enough what's too much and how do you play with the different activities to make sure that it's something that will be doable. So as a reviewer, you want to be thinking about that. Look at the number of activities, look at the amount of content, look at the assessments. Is it doable within, you know, a, a, the, a reasonable amount of time? And then give feedback on that. Um, if in your assessment, um, you think that it's, um, it's like, you know, it's too much. So um, let's go on to learning activities. And um, here, um, this is one of our web pages. And um, we really are trying to help people to think about how to design the, their, um, in, you know, the instructional design of their course. Backwards design is a, is a, is a, good approach thinking about UDL, um, universal uh, design for learning is, is also a good approach. So in, in backwards design, you start with your assessments and work backwards with what are the activities to make sure that there's that alignment. What are the activities? What's the content necessary? And what are the learning objectives that are being targeted by that? Um, so let's look at, um, uh, at this. 
um, just some information on how to look at objectives and how to write them. So when you're looking at a course and looking at their objectives, you want to see whether or not they're well written and and um, you know measurable and um, and specific enough um, or not. And so you can give feedback on the objectives with an, with that understanding of what makes a good um, a good learning a well written learning objective. Um, I like this resource because it gives an example of a poorly written one and a well written one or a better written one and. Um, you know, you will often see, you know, the student will know or the student will understand and it, you can um, improve that significantly by just varying the verbs and have a better, having a better understanding of Bloom's taxonomy, perhaps, which I'm going to talk about in a sec. Um, so this is, I think this is Bloom's taxonomy that I'm going to show you here. Um, so if you're not familiar with Blooms um, and you want to be a course reviewer, it probably would be a good idea to familiarize yourself with it. Um, it is, um, you know, a, actually a, a sort of a rubric um, and it considers the um, what they call the knowledge dimension or um, these um, things that go from concrete knowledge to abstract knowledge, and it involves factual, conceptual, procedural, and metacognitive thinking. And then the cognitive um, process dimension, which is goes from lower order thinking skills to higher order thinking skills. And so at the lower end, you have remember, understand, and apply. And as you get higher, you go into analyze, evaluate, and create. And so when you're writing the objectives, you wanna make sure Obviously, depending on the discipline, depending on the instructor program, and depending on um, the level, you want to make sure they're not all at the remember stage, right? You want to move students through what at whatever level they are in whatever discipline they are through two higher order um, thinking skills uh, and on both the cognitive dimension and the and the knowledge dimension. So it's good to try and understand that when you're looking at um, objectives to make sure that it's not only the student will remember, the student will produce this, or the student will, um, you know, um, interpret this. You want to have some, um, you want to have like a trajectory from the lower order to the higher order um, in terms of thinking skills. Here's another tool that you can use to actually design a learning objective. It's, um, it's uh, developed by Arizona State University. And um, it also, uh, again, uh, relies on Bloom. So you pick your level so you know you start wherever with you know in some of your um objectives may be at the lower um order thinking skills and some of them may be at the higher one so you just pick your level and then you pick um a verb and then you um write out the what you expect the students to do by the end of the course so um um so the students will create a presentation in the format of their choice, narrative text, creative writing, a poem, a song, a story, a script, a drawing. Um, um, and it can be an illustration or it can be a video. Um, it can be audio. And it um, demonstrates how they would apply the theory of relativity. Um, so that's the, the, you know, narrative that was uh, applied around the verb create. And then it's going to give you the choice to copy that and then you can use that and then you can create a new one. So you can use that tool to help you design your um, or improve your objectives. So it might be a recommendation as a reviewer that you give to your instructor to work on their um, their objectives, to have a broader um, array of, of um, the, uh, you know, on the Bloom's um, uh pyramid there uh, to incorporate some higher order thinking skills and that maybe you recommend that they check out this tool um, to help them with that. This tool um, is associated with Blooms and it really allow, it gives you some information um, if you're really interested in, in delving more deeply into this, it gives you the, the levels of, of um, thinking, action verbs that are associated with that, some samples, questions, and some activities, um, product 
effects and outcomes that go with that at each level of blooms. So this is another place where you could go where, it, for example, if you wanted to give an example to the instructor as a reviewer of how to improve a particular um, uh, objective, you could come here and see, okay, like, you, you know, getting a sense of the course, you could say, okay, to move this up um, um, on blooms, you might want to phrase this particular objective instead of the student will know, you might want to phrase it in this way to better, um, uh, you know, to, to create a better objective. Um, I have a number of resources here that to share with you that are so that give you different verbs to use um, associated with each of the levels of, of blooms. And I like this one because it's colorful and has owls. Uh, but if you, you don't like color or owls, um, here's one for you without um, the, and they're different. They're not made by the same people. So the verbs are all different. So um, you can check them all out. They're all, um, you know, um, helpful. I think when you're looking for um, how to design, well, how, you know, for well-designed uh, course objectives. All right. Let's move on to standard 16, which is um, <clears throat> related to, where am I here? Um, a consistent and uncluttered um, environment is established. So 16 is in the design and layout category and many of the design and layout uh, category standards have to do with accessibility, which is another unique thing about Oscar. It really specifically addresses in terms of the design of the course, it, 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 it targets accessibility. So this standard, the first one in this category is associated with um, making the course easy to navigate um, and having it be well organized and um, leveraging the titles of, of documents and uh, categories and folders within the course to really help students navigate, find things, to have them have at a glance advanced organizers for the way that the course is structured. Your um, opinions about every course is going to be structured differently based on who the instructor is, what the discipline is, how they want to teach it. So it conveys a tremendous amount of information with the titles of things. So you want to make that consistent, you want to make it uncluttered. Um, and so let me show you some resources. Um, oh, here's where I'm going to show you, I think, the um, the um, templates. So uh, this is a Google folder. And within this Google folder, you will see um, the uh, each one is a is a folder with the zip file of the particular um, template. So within, I'll just open up the asynchronous folder, <laughs> and you'll see that it has the zip file for the Brightspace export. Um, it has a guide. It has the common cartridge. So if you want to export it to some other learning management system, you can. And then there's a document there that explains the Oscar alignment, which I'm going to show you in a sec. Um, modules, you know, uh, I was talking about the consistency of the structure and the labeling, chunking a course as part of the design of a course. So if you see a course that has 30 modules, you, you know, your feedback might be um, that's, you know, you might want to chunk the course up into a smaller number of modules, even though maybe it's associated with chapters in a book, um, and that's a good logical structure, it's too many modules um, for the cognitive load that is required to, like, understand that from a from a you know a glance level. And there's been studies on this, the magic number for numbers of modules in a course is seven plus or minus two. So if you have 30 modules, you can still have 30 sub modules or sub, you know, folders, just uh, chunk it up into seven or nine and then incorporate the, um, the chapters of the book that you want to use as an organizing mechanism within each of those folders and then give those modules good titles to help the students see at the glance level from the modular level what it is. So it's going to be, you know, sell mitosis and then several chapters on that and then, um, um, you know, whatever the next chapter is, um, you know, chunk the course up into seven 
plus or minus two, and then add um, sub modules if you need to within within the course and be consistent and do that consistently throughout the, the course. Now, there are some courses where there needs to be some inconsistency. So it's kind of, um, you know, you just need to be consistent with your inconsistency, right? Be, and be clear with the labels of things so that students understand and can find what they're supposed to do, when, where, um, why, those kinds of things. Um, so as a reviewer, you're looking at the course with those kinds of eyes, with the eye of a student and saying, could I do this? Is it clear? Can I find things? Does it make sense? Could this be improved in a way that would help me to understand what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go, how I'm supposed to do it? Um, so you're thinking about that as you're looking at the course. Um, the templates uh, that I mentioned earlier, that this is the rationale document that I wanted to show you. Um, so it, it explains why we made decisions that we did when we designed uh, the templates. Um, and so you can have all of the information that you might be interested in, including information about Oscar standards. And, and um, so that's part of the rationale is everything that's in the template is Oscar associated. Um, so when you're looking to explain to an instructor why it might be important for them to do a particular thing and, and it's in the course template, this helps to explain to them why. Uh, we have a number of frequently asked questions. So if you're interested in implementing these um, um, uh, these templates, the, here's some frequently asked questions. Again, templates are openly licensed free to for anyone to use and adapt. And it just will quick start your you and your faculty into some um, well-designed uh, course designs. Um, and they are Oscar informed. Um, all right, this one is, oh, the Oscar alignment, the template alignment. So every element is aligned with a particular uh, Oscar standard. And this organizes that by standard number. So you can better see what the alignment is. All right, let's move on to, <clears throat> um, to here, standard 24, which is, about the linear, um, this is a, a, again in the design and layout um, category and it's about tables. This particular standard is about tables. And I just wanna show you why this is important. And this has to do with accessibility. And here is a table that has not been formatted for accessibility. Um, and I just want you to hear what that sounds like from um, a screen reader perspective. Table with eight columns and five rows, fall term, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, post, back, non dash degree total 2007, 42, 40, 32, 18, 34, 18, 46, 39, 300. Okay, so, you know. You know, it's already challenging enough if you have um, a challenge with, um, uh, you know, with hearing or with seeing. Um, but when you have a table and if you use tables, you can use them. You just need to make sure that they are formatted well for screen readers. And this is where um, if you see um, um, an, a course that is making a heavy use of tables and sometimes Folks use tables to design content on their page. Um, and you just need to make sure to talk with somebody from your accessibility office, your instructional designer, to make sure that you are setting your tables up in a way that will permit a screen reader to interpret them in a way that whoever's listening to it is going to be able to make sense out of it. And you can see what that screen reader was doing was just simply going across right, and reading everything across. So it would be uninterpretable just by listening to it, what makes sense. So if you put the pro proper heads, it'll go down, it'll read fall term, and then it'll, it'll, it'll go down the list. So make sure that you talk with your accessibility folks and your um, uh, instructional designers um, if you are setting tables up. And if you're looking at a course that has tables, you want to check it um, to see if, um, you know, how well that course has been. And uh, within learning management systems like Brightspace, um, it has the Ally Accessibility Checker built in. So you can use that also as a, as a guide for um, 
for what needs improvement in terms of accessibility. All right, let's go to the next standard, which is standard 29. And this has to do with engaging resources, um, um, leveraging collaboration. Um, and in this one, um, just trying to see what I, oh, oh, active learning. Okay, so let's, um, so you wanna make sure we talked about the objectives. Um, we've talked some about content. This is about activities and the activities we want them to be active and engaging and collaborative and um, experiential, if, uh, you know, if it's, if, if that's relevant. Um, um, so th that the students can be engaged and work with each other um, work with you to uh, really, um, you know, understand the content, the concepts, the theories, and be have the uh, opportunity to apply them in some authentic way so that they can learn. Um, so let me go to the resources. So this is Topper that I mentioned, the University of Central Florida um, repository of effective practices against again this is juried it's a juried um, um, repository and within this repository you can mine it for things like interaction and in this I chose a couple um, um, to think about like you know um, when when you're trying to think about activities around your objectives a lot of people will think about, okay, how, what, how do I do this or what do I do in my classroom? And so they may do activities like um, think, pair, share, or they may do role plays or they may do um, debates or whatever. But how do, you, how do you do that in an online environment? So this resource helps you to think about how you can do some things that you might be familiar with um, or, or that are analogous to activities that you might do in the classroom, but do them in an online environment. So this resource is amazing because it gives you description, links to artifacts and citations um, around it. Um, another one that I pulled out um, that I particularly like is asking students to lead online discussions. So again, instead of you leading the discussion, make the students do the work. If, if, if you are doing all of the work, you are the one who's doing all of the learning. So this is really about flipping it and making things active and learner centered for the learners so that you can design activities in your instruction that are making the students um, apply, defend, refute, question their assumptions, um, interact, collaborate, uh, develop something, present something. So making um, students lead discussions is one of the ways that you can um, get them to engage more actively in, in your online um, interactions. I love this resource from the University of Illinois because it has an index of all types of instructional activities and um, and then how to do them in an online environment. And so that would be, I just chose role playing because I, I chose the same thing over in the top area, but it helps you to see things from um, you know how to implement it in a, in an online environment, it gives you you know some uh, recommendations about doing it in a synchronous environment and some about doing it in an asynchronous environment, and um, it, it just gives you an overview of how you might adapt this type of an activity for an online environment of some sort. I also want to share with you this resource that I um, wrote a long time ago, but it's still good. It goes through different types of, I, I call it 50 ways to leave your lecture, but it's alternatives to lecture. So you can have um, students conduct an interview, you can bring in guest speakers, you can do the um, student led discussions, you can have students um, do summer summaries, you can pop up quiz, um, all of these different things um, that you might have analogies for in the face-to-face -face environment, there are ways to, to design the activity so that it, it can work in an online asynchronous environment as well, or a synchronous environment. All right, let's move on to the next standard, which is standard 30. And standard 30 is about, let's see. Uh, 
higher order thinking skills. So the, again, um, we're going back to blooms here. Um, and I may have already covered a lot of this, but <clears throat> so I, I, oh, I wanted to show you this um, cool graphic that helps you to visualize blooms uh, in, a, in a more three-dimensional kind of a way. And so, you know, if you are working on improving your objectives and you want, um, you know, to move up the um, higher order thinking skills, you can, um, uh, which was something I wanted to show you. Uh, you know, do you just pick any one of these, apply, and then um, think of, and then if you're going for the procedural on the knowledge dimension, you just, it, it ends up being here, carry out pH tests of water samples, right? So, so it helps you to kind of visualize that as you move up the knowledge dimension, and, uh, or up and down the knowledge dimension or up and down the cognitive process dimension, different levels are related to blooms. Um, all right, so just another tool related to blooms. Let's see what this one was. Uh oh, my screen froze. Am I frozen? No. Oh, here, um, I wanted to share this with you because it addresses AI. And, um, you know, I'm sure that folks um, are thinking about that. And and um, so here we have Bloom's taxonomy and um, it, we have all of the different um, levels on the cognitive um, uh, uh, dimension here and then how AI can support the uh, and supplement learning. I'm just, you know, some of these things I'm leaving here for you to explore um, on your own and to think about, you know, if you have a course where the instructor is leveraging AI, you want to think about how, you know, it, is are they thinking about this from that perspective? Um, um, you know, that the activity that they're having students do, and is there a way that they could improve their objective or improve um, their um, their assessment based on uh, based on blooms? Let's look at this next one. Oh, this is met. I think this is a resource on metacognition that I put together. Um, and this is something I do in my own instruction. I have students blog. And a blog is only a blog if it's not locked within a learning management system and is public. Um, so you can have if you have something like that in your course and you call it a blog, I would recommend you change the name of that to a journal or to something else because the nature of a blog is that it's public and that the student owns it beyond the end of the course. So I do that in my course. My students all have to have a public blog and, and I use it as a metacognitive um, learning activity. I'm asking students to reflect on their learning, what helps their learning, what hinders their learning, how they're applying what they're learning, how do they know they learn? And these are questions that I ask them in each of my modules and they blog about that publicly and they read each other's blogs and I read their blogs and anyone in the world can read their blogs. So um, so this document here talks about what I did, um, why I do it for those reasons and what students get out of it. So if you're interested in trying that or in recommending something like that to an instructor, this is a good resource to share with them. All right, let's go to the next um, standard is standard 38. This is the one on regular and substantive interaction. And that's, um, you know, uh, a, a, um, you know, a federal regulation, as we talked about earlier, I have a whole section of the Oscar website that is related to RSI. Um, I do a whole workshop um, and in fact, we're going to be doing a session um, in this series on RSI. So if you're interested in understanding that regulation and in helping to elevate um, not only your own understanding, but that in faculty or at your institutional level about how to make sure that you're in compliance with that regulation, I invite you to come to that um, workshop. It's um, or that webinar. Um, the, the one thing I'll say about it here here is that RSI has nothing to do with quality, with online course quality. It is only 
the mechanism that the Department of Education has to determine eligibility for financial aid. And it requires um, uh, interaction that in, is initiated by the instructor and, um, and is regular and substantive. And all of that stuff you, you, it has to be defined. And there are things that qualify for that and things that don't qualify for that. It has absolutely nothing to do with quality. If you do a course that only addresses RSI, it is not a good quality course because students have to interact with each other and they have to interact with content and they have to interact with you in that direction, student to instructor. RSI is only about instructor to student. So if you're interested in learning more about that, come to that workshop and we'll talk much more about it. I do have a form that I share in that workshop that it helps you at the institutional level, at the instructional designer level, at the faculty level, document how you are addressing RSI in your course. So if you're interested, this is a template. You can just make a copy of this and adapt it however you would like. Um, the workshop um, will have a badge that's associated with it. So if you're interested, come to that workshop. Um, all right, let's go on to the next standard, which is 42. And now this is where we talk about learner to learner interaction, which is, as we just discussed, an, a, you know, a, a critical component of a well-designed course. Um, and so you want to um, build community. You want to have um, cooperative and collaborative activities um, designed into an online course. So as you're reviewing a course, take a look at how does the instructor facilitate collaboration and interaction and community building within their course. And this is something that can be improved. Um, uh, so, um, you know, you, you can find it or you look for it. If it's not there, then you can make some suggestions about what to incorporate it into the course in order to address it. And then if they are doing some things um, in it, how can how can they how can it be improved? So I have some resources for you that I'm just going to share with you for you to um, take a look at, um, you know, at your leisure, um, things that um, help to you to understand how to design group work and cooperative activity. And then this other resource here um, is additional information on, um, you know, successful strategies for designing small group work. Um, so you can look at the course and see, you know, how are they, how are they setting up the instructions for any kinds of collaborations, peer review or interactions? Um, and is there something that they could do that might improve, um, improve that activity? Uh, this resource here, uh, so we've moved a little bit over into, um, um, you know, the active learning um, aspects of, of the course. And so I like this resource because it's in a very, very short, succinct way is talking about different types of ways to make um, online um, interactions more active and engaging and, and motivating for students. So I'll leave that resource there for you to check out. Here, 45, we're almost done. Um, we're, we're at assessment now and um, appropriate and authentic methods of, of assessment are essential in an online environment. So when you're reviewing a course, you wanna make sure to take a look at how they're assessing. This is a list of um, online assessment techniques. So you wanna take a look at the various types of assessments that the instructor has designed and see you know, um, if there are things that they could do to improve those. This resource from UC Berkeley um, shows um, a variety of alternative types of assessment. Uh, so you want, might want to mine this for some ideas. If you're um, you know, looking at a course and they have a midterm and a final and they're multiple choice, you might want to suggest some alternatives um, to those types of assessments. Um, this uh, resource here is about rubrics, which are a very important part of um, assessments in online environments. I mean, I would say that's true of any kind of uh, instruction. But what I like about this resource is that it gives you um, examples of discussion rubrics, of portfolio rubrics, of multimedia project rubrics, of simulation rubrics, research rubrics, writing rubrics. There's a lot of, of, of um, examples there. And the same with this resource. It gives you a whole bunch of examples here um, that you can take and modify for your own purposes. 
Um, I have a bunch of resources to support academic honesty. And so if that is a concern um, and, and there are approaches that you're observing in the course um, where that, that concern is evident, then you might wanna check this resource out to help the instructor think about supporting academic honesty and, and minimizing issues that would, um, you know, um, that might come up um, in the course based on how they're trying to assess uh, the student's learning or mastery. These are some also some short additional resources. This is by Faculty Focus. I really like this um, this publisher and they have great articles and this one has a whole bunch of, um, of suggestions on how to minimize or support academic um, um, integrity and honesty. Uh, this one here um, is on uh, how an online instructors can support online student success. I do a whole workshop on that. Um, so I'm gonna leave this as a resource for you so that you can understand there's some theory behind it, but then there are very specific things that the online learner can do uh, to develop those self-regulated learning strategies and things that instructors can do to support their development of those skills. So I go through them all here and you can just click on it and find um, you know, lots of ideas and activities, sorry, sorry, suggestions for um, faculty to improve. The last standard has to do with providing feedback or getting feedback from your learners. So there's lots of ways to do that, but this is not a course evaluation. This is really how you can get information from your students so that it can help you to understand their experience, their actual experience of you and your course and how you can use that information to improve things. So as a, as a reviewer, you can take a look at how does the instructor um, close out their course? Do they ask for feedback from their learners and how do they do that? It's not enough to say, did you like the course or how, how was it? You know, you have to try and get really descriptive, rich feedback. Um, I showed this last time. It's really, it's one of the ways that I collect feedback from students. I ask them to give me um, I use this Padlet and ask them to give advice to future students. So they just finish the course and then I ask them to give feedback to future students on how to be successful in the course. And then my future students get to see that on the first day. Um, I also provided um, links to the, um, the D2L templates that I had showed you earlier that give some very specific um, in, um suggestions on the types of questions to ask both at midterm um, and then also at the end of the course. And at, at midterm, it shows the students that you're interested in their feedback. And you, you know, you're not meant to change the entire design of your course based on one individual's feedback. But if there is something that comes out when you ask the question that you can change reasonably, it shows the students that you care, that you're listening, and that you will make modifications to things um, based on their input. And then at the end of the course, you want to ask some more deep um, questions about their experience of the course and um, things like what they liked best, what could be improved. Um, and I have all of those questions listed on, on the web page I showed you initially. Um, so, so take a look at how the instructor uh, closes the course out. Um, so I'm at the end and I wanted to talk a little bit about providing feedback for people who are going to be reviewers. And um, it's important to understand how to provide feedback. And so I have this resource here that gives you sort of a step by step you know, what to look at first, what to think about it. Um, so it kind of gives you a little bit of, a, of guidance in how to conduct a course review. Um, and then there are examples. And so I didn't give you the rubric, but I gave you my narrative example. And if you remember in the rubric, there's this big block at the end for narrative feedback, in addition to the little pieces that you can do associated with each um, with each standard. So what I did was I just pulled out my narrative feedback and these are reviews that I did um, 
and you can see the type of feedback that I gave and the way that I did it. Now, I'm not saying copy how I do it because I use the word love a lot. And if that's not in your personality, like your, your feedback should be from your personality and your perspective. But I just wanted to give you some examples, um, you know, of, of, uh, of uh, general feedback um, on the design of a particular course. And then the other resource I have for you has to do with providing warm and cool feedback. And so you want to, you know, acknowledge things that the person is doing well, and then give some insight and input into things that can be improved. And I, I really think about it like that, what's working, and what can be improved, and and always focus on the what's working first. Um, give them some good feedback about good things that they're doing in their course first, and then give them some um, suggestions and ideas about what can be improved. So I'm a little bit over time, uh, I see, and I am just going to stop there and see, you know, what, um, Aaron, what. Are, is there anything I could address uh, from the chat? Thanks, Alex. So we did have a couple questions and we had some other people um, chiming in with some things that they do to help answer. Um, okay. I do have some folks that we'll follow up with in an email, uh, you and I, for some specific examples. But other than that, um, before we close, I just wanna make sure if anybody wanted to ask a question that you had the opportunity to do so. Well, while we're waiting for someone, um, I just wanted to um, toss the um, additional resources that I wanted to make sure that you were aware of. So we are inviting you to continue this conversation with us in our online teaching community. So you're welcome to join. Anyone is welcome to join, whether you're in SUNY or not. Um, and this is where we interact and continue conversations like we're, we're having today. Um, it, and it's a Facebook group, so you just join. And then we also, if you're, if you use the Oscar hashtag, that's how we sort of find all of the Oscar related uh, questions. So just um, if your question is Oscar related or your comment is Oscar related, just add the Oscar, you know, hashtag Oscar to it in, in the, um, you know, in the, in the group. Um, I wanted to mention that everyone is going to get a badge for part participating in this um, webinar and um, we use Credly and so you will be eligible for a number of, of um, uh, 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 badges. Uh, you can become a fellow and so most likely an experienced online practitioner. So you would qualify for that. If you're not within SUNY, you would qualify for the um, friend of SUNY badge, which I would love to issue you these badges. Um, and then <laughs> that's the friend of SUNY badge. And then for this workshop, this webinar, um, you, you will get the, um, um, the, the, become an Oscar reviewer badge. And then if you actually want certification, as an Oscar reviewer, you need to take everything you learned in this workshop, go review someone's course. It has to be someone else's course, not your own. And then um, work with the instructor to make the improvements on the course and um, improve the course and then come and provide evidence um, of what you learned. And um, I can, you know, if you look at this um, link, you'll you'll see what the evidence is that's required to earn the reviewer certification. And anyone is eligible to um, to get this certification. I know there are a ton of instructional designers within SUNY that you know qualify for this. So just you know, send me the evidence and I'll, I'll issue you your badges. And um, for those of you who might be outside of SUNY, we have a small fee for that because I am using SUNY public funds to review your evidence and issue your, your badge. So it's very nominal, but I would love to issue you badges um, certifying you as Oscar reviewers as well. And if you have any questions about that or you want to like talk about it, um, just contact me. Uh, you know, we're, we're very flexible and we want you to get these certifications and these badges. So if there's some reason why we have to modify the process in some way in order to accommodate your particular circumstance or context, um, we want to do that. And again, um, all, all of the links that I showed you today are on that page, that web links page, including um, 
you know, everything that I showed you. Um, and I'm sure Aaron is putting that in the chat. And this is the page, which my thing is frozen. My page is frozen. Um, but I think that is it. Thank you, everybody. And I, I'm willing to take any questions if you want to unmute and ask a question. I'm happy to chat with you. I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> let, me, let me stop sharing. Thanks, Alex. All of the information on um, certification and where you can find the recordings of our Oscar webinar series are in the chat for you. Thank you. Great. Right. I'm glad that was helpful. Good. Nice to see you all. I'm looking.